I'm Tim Elmore. I lead a nonprofit organization called Growing Leaders, and we partner with schools, nonprofits, athletic clubs, homes with parents, anybody that works with the next generation of kids. We try to help them better connect with that generation and then equip that generation. So that's that's why we exist. When you say, I want to grow the leaders of tomorrow, create mm -hmm. the leaders of mm -hmm. tomorrow, what kind of leader? Yeah, it's a great question because I think there's a thousand definitions out there. When we say leader, we mean one who serves people and solves problems. In fact, when I'm with an educator and I'm in an elevator and I've got five minutes to talk to them, I'll say, we just want to create graduates that know how to solve problems and serve people. And every educator goes, yes, that's what I want. So yes, we need reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we need people with life skills, with the skills to relate to people and lead teams and communicate well and cast vision. So um, now we do a lot of work internationally. And one time we were translating a book in another language and they mistranslated the word leader. They used the word power trip. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know someone who gains power. We believe power follows leadership very often. You gain influence. But it starts with an with a, an aptitude to serve and solve, uh, serve people, solve problems, and once you do that, you tend to earn the right to influence other people. So, what would you say are the traits, the characteristics of the leaders? They have a vision for the future. They have a picture in their mind of a better tomorrow, and then somehow they've carved out some steps to get to that better picture. So they're able to help other people understand if we did these three things we could get there. Most people need those steps. They, they go, yeah, I like that picture. How do we get there? And most people don't know. I think a leader by nature needs to be good with people. I, I have a hard time divorcing good leadership with good people skills. So we want to build a, a new generation that's really good with people. That's very difficult if I'm on my smartphone all the time. So we've got to get them offline or yeah, we got to get them offline to build those, those emo that emotional intelligence. Um, and then I, say, I would say lastly, innately, it involves courage. I think the difference between perhaps a leader and a manager, and we need both, is the leader does some courageous things. They go first. Leaders go first. And in fact, when I describe what a leader is to students, I often say this, if you're not willing to embody what you're asking of others, don't start. You've got to live it before you tell anybody else to do it. So I know that sounds almost cliche and, and obvious, but there's too many leaders out there barking out orders, but they're not willing to do the very thing they're calling others to do. Tim, you know there, there is another very common cliche out there, and it's uh, if leaders are born or are made. Mm -hmm. yes. So this kind of leadership that you are describing yeah. to us, anyone can be one of those leaders, or you need some specific Qualities. Yeah, good question. I actually believe everyone needs some training, even the natural born leader. Because if I'm a natural born leader, that means I probably have a take charge personality. I'm kind of driven. Maybe I'm ADHD. I don't know, but I'm, I'm lots of energy. But I still need training with people. I still need to learn to be patient when the team goes slower than I want to go. So training is needed for both. But this is what I always say. I think the world is full of two kinds of leaders and every one of us fit into one of two kinds. We're either a habitual leader or a situational leader. Habitual leaders are the ones that lead out of habit. That's the natural leader. They're that child that's on the playground at recess and they're taking over the kickball team, you know? They're just the natural leader. But that's probably 10 to 15% of the population. The other 85 to 90% of us are what I call situational leaders. Those are the ones that would say, I don't really consider myself a great leader, but put me in the right situation one that matches who I am, my passions, my strengths, my gifts, in that one spot, I'm really good. Haven't we all seen a kid in a classroom or at a school campus and they're just so quiet and shy? And the moment you put them on the soundboard or you put them in this, oh my gosh, they've come alive. What happened to that boy? Well, what happened is he found his situation. So I think one of the jobs of parents, educators, and employers is we gotta help this next generation find their situation. And the moment we do, I think there's leadership inside of every one of us. Maybe not a CEO of a big company, maybe not the president of a, of a country, but they found a place where they can play their card. I'll give you one example. My daughter, Bethany, could have been voted the least likely to be a leader 
when she was growing up. She was just <laughs> chill. Her favorite word was whatever, whatever. So um, growing up, I thought, well, I teach leadership, but it won't be this one, you know. But she heard me teach this situational leader. And I watched her in high school begin to find places where she could serve. And when she was in college, all four years of her college life, her university time, she would call me at least once on the phone to have this conversation. Dad, I think I've found my situation this year. And I knew what she meant. She meant I found the place that I can serve, that I'm not trying to imitate somebody else, but I've found who I've been made to be. And that's what I want for every kid. So Tim, you, you are always referring to, uh, we have to teach this next generation yeah. and have to be leaders. Mm -hmm. So in order to people understand, when we mean next generation, which generation are we talking about? <laughs> Good question. We probably should have started with that one, shouldn't we? Well, for the last 18 years, we've been studying the millennial generation. I think that word has gone global. We all seem to understand the millennials, but the millennials are now young adults. So um, they're young professionals. Generation Z or Z is the one that follows the millennials. They follow generation Y, which is the millennials. So it's a generation that's made up of mostly the kids that have been born and growing up since the turn of the century. So we measure them, everybody measures them slightly different, but we measure them right about the turn of the century, the last 18 years or so, who've grown up with smart technology and digital lives. I call them screenagers when they get into high school. <laughs> um, different world that you and I perhaps grew up with, slightly different than you, very different than me. So we're trying to help the adult understand who they are so they can lead them. So what drives this Gen Z? Mm. And what are the differences compared to the millennials yeah. and previous generations? Yeah, there's definitely some similarities to millennials. I think both generations are at home with technology. They're digital natives. Um, I think they have grown up very much um, in a fast paced, almost 80, I mentioned ADHD before, and it's not funny, but so many are just, their attention spans are about six to eight seconds. So now that doesn't mean they can't pay attention longer for the teachers listening here. They'll binge watch Netflix for hours, but um, they'll divert their attention if you're not engaging them. Every six to eight seconds, they'll look somewhere else. Those are the similarities. The differences are this. When you track Generation Z data, this is a generation that ever since smart technology, the smartphone has been out, you will see a rise in anxiety that directly parallels the rise in social media. Now, I'm not blaming social media completely. I'm just saying when they're consuming 10,000 messages a day, looking at, you know, scrolling through data, I don't think our minds were meant to take in that much information and it causes angst and stress and depression. So if you look at the data in industrialized nations, anxiety marks Generation Z far more than any of the previous three generations. It, it's concerning to me. We can talk more about that later, mm -hmm. but we've got to find a way to help them overcome their stress, angst, and anxiety and, and depression. Um, another one though is they are hackers. Now that's a computer term, but they are hacking their way through life. Uh, many of them, let me get, paint a picture for you, maybe had a millennial brother or sister that's older that bought into the line from mom and dad, just go to college and you'll get a great job. Well, yeah. they went to college, the great job didn't work out. In fact, they're working at a restaurant or a Starbucks, which they could have done before college, and they have a $28,000 debt or whatever the currency is. So Gen Z goes, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna hack my way through. So after high school graduation, they might do a couple of MOOCs, massive online open courses, an internship, a mentor, a class here, and my resume is this list of, of a variety of items that I show an employer so I can do a gig. We call it the gig economy. I'll do a gig here for a year and a half, a gig there for a year, another gig here for two years. I might have six jobs in my 20s, maybe. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just a very different world than, than my generation that stayed loyal and worked in one place for decades and you know, then retired. Considering these um, life experiences mm -hmm. that TNC yeah. has experiences, is experiencing, I would like to talk about how to educate these mm -hmm. people, yeah. how teachers and parents at home can excel in education, in educating those Young yeah, students. yeah. The typical school around the world, 
the teacher is the commander. I have all this information I need to download. Take notes. You'll have to do a t an exam in, in December or May. And Gen Z just doesn't learn this way. They want to do something. They want to be experiential. So one of the terms that's sweeping the educational world by taking it by storm is a term called metacognition. Metacognition. So metacognition means above my thinking. It means I'm thinking and analyzing how I'm thinking. So a, a good teacher for Gen Z might say, I'm not starting with a lecture, I'm giving you a project to do. You have to figure it out. Now at first they won't like that because that's not what they're used to, but innately they love this. So I always say we need to be less prescriptive and more descriptive, you follow me? So instead of prescribing every step along the way, step one, step two, step three, say let's describe a goal that you'd like to reach as a Gen Z student and then you tell me the steps you think we should take. I'll be a consultant, not a commander. Um, you're the leader of this learning. You own and engage in the learning more than me. I actually fir first learned this by accident. I was mentoring a group of college students years ago, and they were all at the university. And one of them typed an email to me and said, Dr. Tim, who's gonna, le make, uh, who's gonna choose the topic for our next lesson? I grabbed my laptop and started typing in, I can do that or at least I thought that's what I typed. The letter I is right next to the letter U on my keypad. I accidentally typed, you can do that. Well, little did I know, I just empowered him to get with a group and come up with a game plan. When I showed up, I opened my mouth to start teaching. They wouldn't let me talk. They, one had a game, one had a video ready, one had a discussion, one had something else going. I never told him it was a mistake. <laughs> I just said, go. And I learned about metacognition. The best learning happens when someone says, I believe in you enough to say, here's a problem, let's solve it, you do it. So you have to engage them, give them experiences yep. and not be, I mean, they, they don't like being passive learners, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, can I give you an acronym? I think this works in Espanol. Uh, we call it EPIC teaching, E-P-I-C. So the letter E is what you just said, experiential. They're not looking for a sage on the stage with a lecture. We think they're looking for a guide on the side with an experience. So the more teachers can create an experience in the classroom or outside on the lawn, but it's an experience from which we dialogue, now we've got them. But it was an experience that engaged them, not a talking head. The letter P in EPIC reminds me, students are participatory. Now this is slightly different than experiential. Think about the world children grow up in today. We allow them to participate in the outcomes of where almost everything is going. They get to choose what they want for lunch. They get to choose where they go on vacation. As young adults, they can hardly watch a reality TV show without voting on who stays on the show next, next week. So I'm just saying, how could we as educators let them have a say, let them have a vote, if you will, on where this program or curriculum is going? I realize you have something you need to share, but how could it be different this year because they're in the class than it was last year when they weren't in the class? The statement I love to use to describe this principle is this, students support what they help create. Students support what they help create. If we can let them be creators, we've got them, we engage them. The letter I in EPIC reminds me, they're image rich. They've grown up with the images on screens, videos, DVDs. Now it's streaming video with Netflix and everything else. So I would say to educators, how could you anchor the big idea that you want to share with an image, a visual, a metaphor? Certainly there's lots of other dates and battles and war generals that you need to memor they need to memorize, but how could a picture anchor the big idea? And you keep referring back to that image. This is their native language. Dr. Leonard Sweet is a futurist. He said images are the language of the 21st century. I think he's right. So even at Growing Leaders, we've created an entire uh, curriculum for social emotional learning, leadership and character called Habitudes. Habitudes are images that form leadership habits and attitudes, but it's all the principles taught with images. Okay, one last letter. The letter C in EPIC is they're connected. You mentioned that earlier. They're connected socially as well as technologically. So how could we take a classroom full of, let's say, 25 students and break them up into groups of three or four? and give them a well-crafted question or two, one that cannot be answered with yes or no, and let them connect. 
let them think out loud. Let them argue. It's messy. And yes, they'll say something goofy and funny, but I've learned students come up with some of the most innovative ideas if we turn it over them and say, you together come up with this. So the question I ask for educators is this, how epic are you in your classroom? I mean, when you were explaining this different approach to uh, educating these people, I was thinking on what's the role that two things have. I mean, um, one of them is play, mm -hmm. and the other one is technology as a tool. I think it's huge, both of these. I think, if I heard you correctly, it should feel like play. It should be something that I enjoy doing, that's engaging to me. I lose track of the time when I'm doing this thing that I love. I think that's how education was supposed to be, which means we may not learn everything, but we learn something that we just absolutely love. And that makes me not only have a better sense of identity, but it makes me want to get the other things I might need to learn to master that top. So there are schools up in the Northeast, not far from where you live, that have actually engaged the students in metacognition. One is called the Independent School. It's at a, a traditional high school, but it was student driven. A student made it up. There's gardening, sh cooking, all, all kinds of real life stuff in addition to math, but they learn the math because they need it for cooking or they learn the, you know, the other sub science because they need it for gardening, but they're driven by something they love. So play is very important. There ought to be a sense that they go, I can hardly wait to get to your class. Uh, so that would be one. The other question was technology. technology. Tool. Yeah. I actually think so many teachers are afraid that technology is only being abused, not used, that they say, leave your phones outside the classroom or don't bring them in or whatever. I, I don't know that that's always smart because that's going to be their future. <laughs> if, <laughs> your, your classroom becomes less like their life rather than more like their life. So it's gonna be extra hard to engage them. But we need to be redemptive. We need to be constructive. So I know teachers that will use the, the smartphone for research or they've got the, they can text message all their students and communicate that way. There's all kinds of marvelous ways. There's even educational games you can play on the phone that they can participate and vote or weigh in with an answer on a phone. So I guess my short answer is, I actually think we need to make technology a servant, not a master, but it should serve us in the classroom. So what do we need to change the mindset of uh, educators? Well, let me first speak from my experience and then we can go global on this, okay? Um, the public school system in our, my home country, the country you and I are living in, in America, was reformed in 1859 and it was built for the Industrial Revolution. Factories were popping up, cars were being invented soon after. Uh, so the school system was meant to emulate a factory. So they started with bells or whistles, just like a factory. The content was automated, done, you know, just like, just like a factory, you got an assembly line. We started pushing kids into schools by the hundreds and then the thousands, and it was like a factory. The kids were, you know, spit out at the end of the journey and nothing was really unique about it. Well, fast forward now 150 years, and um, we're not in the Industrial Revolution anymore. We're in the innovation age. And so we still are working with a system that was built for a century ago, at least in our country. Uh, here's another good example. Um, in 1914, a man by the name of Frederick J. Kelly came up with a multiple choice test. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've all taken those, you know, yep. circle C, <laughs> A, B, so he came up with that test because in 1914, America was receiving so many immigrants who were getting out of Europe because of World War I. Remember, you don't remember, you remember reading about that day, you weren't there. Um, but um, they were coming in and it was only meant to filter people to say, you should go to a farm, you should go to a factory, you should go here, you should go there. But it wasn't meant to test whether they really learned something, but immediately schools started picking it up. And in 1917, when the war was ending, he said, I suggest we stop using this thing I've created. It's not a good way to learn, to teach. But alas, the schools had picked it up and they fired him and we kept using it ever since. So I think what I'm saying is we perpetuate a system that worked 100 years ago or even 50 years ago that just doesn't work today. So the answer, what if we said, if we were to start over, if we were to walk out of our school building, 
come back in and say, we're starting over, what would we do? What would we do different? Well, we'd start a whole new reform just like happened in 1859, but it would look different and it would have, it would have computers and technology and, and it would have innovation and would have experiences. We would, we would mimic the workplace today and the students would love it because they want to get career ready. How do we overcome this yeah. resistance? Yeah, it's a great question and it's not going to be fixed overnight. Most teachers that are in the system love their kids, they love the students, they love their colleagues, but they realize the system's broken. I would suggest a beta test. In other words, every class isn't going to change overnight, but what if we took one class and said, let's experiment with this class. Let's try metacognition. Let's try epic learning. Let's try more project-based learning. You know, all those things I've just talked about. And we just see how it goes. If it goes well, and I bet it will, then with the attention of the rest of the team, oh my gosh, what are you doing over there? The grades are going up and the students are engaged and discipline problems are going down and students are graduating, all the things we measure. Then we've got a case to be built. So what if we begin to look more like this all across the school? Now, the argument I hear all the time from teachers is, look at all this material I have to get through. I have to lecture. I would say, you don't have to be epic every day, but maybe once a week or twice a week. Just enough where students go, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I want to see it. You know, yeah. just enough creativity and innovation that they're longing to be with the adult who wants to share and listen and, and, and learn together. And switching a little bit the topic, I know you have done a lot of work with parents as well. Yeah. How to uh, helping them understand the ch their children mm -hmm. and uh, how to better engage them. And uh, I would like also to speak about the role of the parents in engaging okay. these people. So I'm not a parenting expert, but the conversation we just had about, about education, I did a book called Marching Off the Map, but I did, I have done a couple of books for parents. The latest book I did is called 12 Huge Mistakes Parents Can Avoid. As I look at the landscape of parents today, I see a generation of parents that really want to do a good job. For many, their, their child is their most important priority. You know, you see this all the time. And, and so they're hovering over them like helicopters or snow plows or whatever. The biggest mistakes I think we make, we make by accident, but here they are. We risk too little, we rescue too quickly, we rave too easily, and reward too easily. Now, here's what I mean by that. We risk too little. I think we're in such a generation that safety is such a priority that we haven't wanted our kids to take any risks. But wouldn't you agree? Risk is how we grow up. I, I skin my knee, but I, but I get back up and I try again. I get back on my bike and I try to ride again. Those are normal childhood things, but we've been so concerned for their safety. Sometimes I think they're biologically on target, but emotionally behind because they've never been able to fail. And that's where we learn. We rescue too quickly. This is a cousin to the last one. I think parents are rescuing their children, coming in to negotiate the grade of their child, their child made with a teacher, or sometimes negotiating at the university with a professor. So I think we need to stop rescuing so much and let your child grow up and do the negotiation themselves. Raving. We live in a day where we want the self-esteem of our children to be good. I do too. I'm a dad. I want my kids to be. But we don't build self-esteem by affirmation alone. They need to accomplish something. It's both affirmation and achievement. So we need to let them uh, do the job that they need to do. And instead of telling them they're awesome for putting the fork in the dishwasher, we need to say, thanks for doing the job you did. And then make sure our praise is for those things that really excelled. And then rewarding. I don't know how aware you are, but it seems like everywhere I've been in, in our country, we're giving trophies out to everybody just for playing, just for showing up. And, and so again, we, I just feel like we need to reward appropriately. I'm for rewarding. But kids start realizing this doesn't mean anything if you give it to me just for showing up. Then they start thinking, well, then I should show up on the job, don't have to do anything, and my boss is going, no, it doesn't work that way. So I just caution parents, collaborate with the school and with the teachers to make sure you're building good men and women when the, when the journey's over. The statement I like best is this, we must prepare the child for the path instead of the path for the child. I have heard you say yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> what things can they do at home? Mm. I mean, maybe 
I know you are a parent. I'm yeah. not a parent yes. yet. Yes. You are. Okay. So some specific things that okay. you have done with your daughter. Okay, good. Um, I'll share a couple of thoughts. Um, I remember when they were both, m both my kids were pretty young, eight and 12 years old. We were having talks to them at the dinner table about people skills. But dad's lecture was not going over very well. You know, it's just blah, 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 blah. And so we thought we need to make this epic. So what my wife and I decided to do was we decided to have a party at our house for our adult friends. And we asked our kids to host the party. Now, at first they thought, oh my gosh, this is so stupid. But they eventually thought, okay, we gotta do this. They learned to answer the door, invite Mr. Mr. Jones inside. May I take your coat? Have you met Mrs. Smith? Would you like some iced tea? So we be began to build people skills in them. And then the dialogue came afterwards. Remember, experience then discussion. So that party was an experience that learned to a, led to a learning time. But then we've also, I would have them watch the news and pick out one problem on the news and say, if I was in charge of this, what would I do to solve it? But that began a, a real life conversation rather than a hypothetical, you need to take out the trash or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. But probably the wisest decision my wife and I made as parents was in the 13th year of our children's lives. Bethany was our firstborn, Jonathan was four years behind. But um, I sat down with my daughter Bethany when she was 13 and about ready to enter her teenage years. And I said, Bethany, I wanna create with you tonight a rite of passage experience. Many countries do this around the world. But I said, tonight, let's you and I choose six women that will be one day mentors for you this next year. Women that you think are really cool and women that your mother admire as wonderful role models. And we pick women since she's a woman. With, with my son, Jonathan, we pick some guys. But it didn't take my daughter just a few minutes and she had these six amazing ladies that she wanted to meet with. Some from our neighborhood, some from our church, some from places that we worked. The next day I called every one of these six ladies up and I said, this is gonna sound crazy, but would you be a one day mentor for our daughter Bethany this next year. Just pick a day in the next 365 days. And I said, all I'm asking is, let her shadow you that day. Let her just go with you. If you go to work, take her to work. If you stay at home, keep her at home. But all I ask is, let we want her to watch you live your life because we so admire the life you live. And I said, the only thing I ask of you is would you share one life message with our daughter Bethany? A message you wish you would have heard when you were 13, but no one ever shared it with you. Every one of these ladies said yes, and it was an amazing experience. I cannot tell you how emotional and powerful it was. I'll give you one quick example. Sarah was the very first woman. She took Bethany and surprised her one morning. Her day was at the hospital. Sarah is a registered nurse. She works in a maternity ward at the hospital. So she took Bethany down to the maternity ward. Bethany was helping women give birth to babies between nine and three. I mean, it was crazy. She saw every C-section, natural birth, everything. At the end of the, th at three o'clock, Sarah took her out of the maternity ward and took her into another room in the hospital where she taught a class for unwed mothers. Bethany sat amidst a bunch of other teenage girls that were pregnant and probably didn't wanna be. At the end of the day, do you know what Sarah's life message was for our daughter, Bethany? It was on abstinence, waiting for the husband that you were going to marry, or waiting for the right man that you fall on, rather than just being sexually active with everybody. Well, can you imagine how powerful that message was <laughs> that particular day of her life, rather than my lecture on the subject? So, every one of these ladies had an experience. Uh, one, they, one flew up to New York City for the day, another one did this, another one did, one went downtown Atlanta and they worked with um, underprivileged families, uh, disadvantaged families and gave them food and blankets. But every single one of the women had a message that we wanted to echo into our daughter's life. And it wasn't that we had never said it before, it was just that someone else was echoing the values. I watched my daughter change that year as she had older adult mentors just speak into her life. At the end of the year, we had all six of these ladies over to the house. Bethany served them dinner. And then the climax to the entire year, we all went into the family room of our home. Bethany had all the ladies sit around and she's just this little eighth grade girl. 
but she sat in the middle of the room in a chair and one by one, she looked each one of them in the eye and she read a letter to them that she had written just for them. Dear Miss Sarah, this is what I learned from you. This is how my life changed. Thank you. Dear Miss Sandra, dear Miss Betsy, this is what I learned from you. This is how my life changed. Thank you. Well, you can imagine it was a very emotional evening together as we talked and shared. But at the end, I began to talk about the, the rite of passage and how this is supposed to be a marker for girls to become women and boys to become men. Well, I couldn't get it through. I was, I was just tear. I was crying, but I didn't even have to get through my words. Every one of these women was intuitive and knew exactly what was going on. They got down on the floor and looking up at our little daughter, they just began to speak words of affirmation and words of blessing. Bethany, I believe in you. Bethany, you're going to be a great leader one day. I can see it. Bethany, you're going to be a great wife one day if you choose to be. A great mother one day if you choose to be. We saw her just grow emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. But it was because the voices of other neighbors, friends, colleagues spoke into her life and said those things that we believe that we needed someone else to say. I love this idea because uh, when I see my friends who are parents, usually they struggle. I mean, yeah. they all of them want to have independence, yeah. reliant, yeah. resourceful children. But then they have these uh, struggles. I remember a couple of weeks ago, a friend told me, my daughter is not good in math. But yeah. I know math is so important for yeah, the world yeah. that we are building. I mean, mm -hmm. this uh, in yeah. world of knowledge, of yeah. innovation, what can I do? I mean, I see that very often. Parents that don't want to put too much pressure mm -hmm. on yes. their children. Yeah. So how can they yeah. deal with this? Yeah. Well, two things real quick. Number one, fall in love with a word yet. You're not good at math yet. You're not good at spelling yet. You're not good at yet. I, Carol Dweck at Stanford University says that's her favorite word in the vocabulary because it's, it produces a growth mindset. You can still grow. The second thing I would suggest is I found that my wife and I were not the best subject mentors for math or spelling or whatever, but if we found uh, another student that was just about four years older or three years older, they were so cool. My son and daughter wanted to meet with a cool kid. So Jonathan had a math mentor who was several, well, about four years older, they loved it. And of course it was a win-win because he got to mentor my son and loved teaching a younger kid how to do this. And my son received it so well from a kid that he thought was cool, he wanted to pay attention. So maybe that's a specific suggestion for parents to employ. How does the experiences, the life experiences that these young yeah. people have had influence their perception of what it means to have a job, even of the job market. I mean, yes. and how yeah. the employers can yeah. really embrace and retrain these people. It's a great question. So the majority of Gen Z sees themselves as entrepreneurs. Even if they're not, that's how they see themselves. <laughs> I'm gonna start something amazing and make a million dollars. So just know they've got that mindset of, I'm gonna create something, innovate, uh, build. So if they come to a traditional job, I think we need to know that that's the mindset they come with and they want to innovate. Secondly, I love the idea that Jack Welch made popular way back 25 years ago. He called it reverse mentoring. That's where a young graduate comes to the first job, but instead of just getting a 50 year old mentor to pour into them and say, this is what you need to know about this company, you do it both ways. So the 50 year old does need to share, this is how we work around here. Here's some things you need to know but I wanna learn from you. How could that latest app you just purchased be used for marketing at this company? How could we better employ Snapchat or, you know, but learn, this gives dignity to both generations, builds relationships between two generations, and I think just makes us better and more ready for tomorrow. I actually believe Generation Z brings an intuition with them about where the world is going that we don't have. When I say we, not you, me, I don't know where the world's going. But I think a 22 year old knows where the world's going. He gets Uber, he gets Airbnb. You know, it's just, so we've got to do this reverse mentoring where we're willing to listen as well as talk with this next generation.
I would like you to share an idea or a message that uh, you think it's important. For me, it's really, it's really powerful, this, this sentence that you have, let's prepare kids for the path, regardless yeah. what yes. the path is, yeah. instead of vice versa, yes. <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I let you choose the one that you prefer. Oh, wow. I love that phrase, you know, that I do. Um, this may seem so elementary, but I believe our leadership as adults begins with this. Susan Peters once said, children have a much better chance at growing up if their parents have done so first. And all that says is, don't expect them to mature if you're acting immature, mom. If you're on Facebook all day long. Many of the kids in our focus group said, I never talked to my mom. She's on, she's on Facebook or, Snap or, you know, or Instagram all day long. How do we expect to raise good kids if we're guilty of the very things we're accusing them of. So we've got to make sure we model maturity. Uh, in fact, can I close with a story? Sure. One of my favorite stories of the principle I'm talking about, do it before you ever ask them to do it, comes from Mahatma Gandhi way back in the 1940s. When he was in India leading that revolution, that peaceful revolution, he had a woman come to him one day and she brought her little girl with her. And she said, Gandhi, my little girl starts, she eats way too much candy, way too much sugar. Tell her to stop eating so much sugar. Well, Gandhi just kind of thought for a moment and he said, no, come back in two weeks. She said, why? Tell her right now. No, come back in two weeks. She goes, okay. She walked away. Two weeks later, she comes back with her daughter and she says, would you tell her now? And this time Gandhi got down face to face with her and says, stop eating so much sugar. She goes, okay. And she walked away. Well, about that moment, the mom said, why didn't you tell her two weeks ago? And very wisely, Gandhi just said, because two weeks ago, I ate too much sugar. All he was saying was, I didn't want to preach something that I wasn't practicing first. I feel like teachers, employers, parents, let's make sure we're practicing what we preach. If we're angry with them, should we look in the mirror first and say, am I doing it right in front of them? Tim, thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.